Uh, we're going to get started. Thank you very much for your patience here and for coming to uh, hear about the ecosystem for emerging social entrepreneurs, what we call the pathway to action. By brief introduction, I'm Oliver Libby. I'm the chair and co-founder of the Resolution Project, which is an organization that helps undergraduate students launch their own social ventures. So we have a pretty good perspective on what it takes to get off the ground in the sector. Um, but the best thing about Resolution, as far as today is concerned, is that we have an amazing team of advisors and uh, supporters, many of whom have elected to come and help us take part in this panel and share their experiences. Uh, it's great to be particularly at a conference that focuses on P3 and public-private partnerships in general because it is so important to what we do. And so to illustrate that today, we're going to do something a little bit different with a panel that is very full of great insights and experience. We're going to go through three mini fireside chats, if you will, that will take us through the ecosystem of an emerging social enterprise and an emerging social innovator. So we're going to start with a terrific duo uh, that I'll be very pleased to moderate. Cheryl Wudun, Pulitzer Prize winning author, uh, businesswoman, a journalist, an extraordinary thinker in this space, and someone who has interviewed dozens, if not hundreds, probably, of social entrepreneurs coming into the sector. Uh, and Shiza Shahid, the co-founder of the Malala Fund. Uh, I know it's probably not something you've heard about lately, but Malala Fund is doing some great things. Uh, and Shiza is, is also involved in impact investing and particularly with a focus on female founded businesses. We'll move from that founding catalytic moment of what it takes to get off the ground into a fireside chat on what it takes to move towards scale. And that will be curated by George Seattis, who is the founder of Group 113, a branding and marketing agency, but also co-founder of the Resolution Project and president. Uh, and he will be curating a discussion between Rachel Chong the founder of Catch a Fire, which is a true public-private partnership in many ways and a great social enterprise, and Soraya Darabi of Zaidi, and also someone who is involved heavily in the impact investing space now and getting more so by the day. And then we will finally wrap up our conversation with Tracy Allard, the executive director of the Resolution Project and a expert in nonprofits, who is also going to be joined on stage by great uh, panel representing kind of the, the highest end of the funders and supporters in the sector, uh, Ryan Whalen, the Director of Strategic Initiatives at the Rockefeller Foundation, also a senior person in the Bloomberg administration. Uh, and then, uh, let's see, and then Ann Veneman, who is actually someone who represents every part of this sector. She was the Secretary of Agriculture for the United States. She was the Executive Director of UNICEF for five years and achieved legendary uh, repute in our industry. Uh, in the social sector, and then is also a board member of several uh, very large companies you would have heard of. So with that, we will take you through the ecosystem. Let's get started right now. We'll have time for questions at the end, so hold them. And let me invite uh, Cheryl and Chiza up here. Great. Well, thank you very much for joining. So again, we're going to be focused on what it takes to get off the ground in the space. And so with that in mind, I want to start our conversation, and we're going to have a real conversation up here, um, with how the best ideas in the social sector are bubbling up these days. Is it large institutions that are uh, spinning off good ideas? Is it individual entrepreneurs? What are you seeing in terms of how these ideas are becoming new social enterprises? Shiza, can we start with you on this? Sure, thank you. Um, you know, I think there's a growing number of young, um, driven, entrepreneurs, activists, advocates in communities around the world who are looking at their societies, uh, understanding the problems that exist, and then applying their talents, their skills to coming up with solutions. And I think there's a growth in these entrepreneurs and advocates leveraging science and technology. So you have new products coming in that address health issues and education issues, but because they're developed by local entrepreneurs, they also understand distribution and education and how do you train communities in, in, how, to, in how to use the products. Um, and at the same time, I think there is a growth in um, a, a hybrid approach, so mo cutting across sectors, not just addressing problems from a nonprofit approach, uh, but looking at um, a hybrid investment model, a hybrid for-profit, non-profit model. Um, and that's promising because that means hopefully better ideas, but also hopefully more sustainable and scalable ideas. 
Terrific, and, and Cheryl, I was particularly pleased because the, the name of your uh, last book, A Path Appears, uh, has in it uh, the pathway uh, that we're talking about in this session. So when that appears for people, wh when is that appearing for people? How are these people getting started? Well, first of all, I wanna thank you for inviting me, and it's a, a real delight to meet all of you. I would say that we're at a very interesting moment in time because uh, we have a revolution going on in uh, data-driven, evidence-based solutions for many of social uh, society's problems. And out of that, you are getting a, just a plethora of people from all uh, areas, it, from bubbling up, from top down, from middle uh, institutions in, in corporate. So as she said, I totally agree with what she said. I think there's a broad spectrum right now. On the right hand side, you have um, you know, pure profit corporations, uh, profit seeking corporations. On the left, you have NGOs. Then you have almost every other kind of hybrid, if you will, uh, you know, in between. You've got NGOs that are developing revenue generating businesses. You have corporations that are investing in or donating into NGOs. But you also have these a wide spectrum of 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 um, you know of these hybrids. And right, I don't think we're at the peak moment yet. We have a ways to go because there's still a disconnect. So you do have a lot of social entrepreneurs, people who are seeing all of this research being done and say, well, you know, this points to, so in microfinance, there was a huge amount of, of you know, glamour and, and excitement around micro lending. And it was the craze. And so then there was some really academically rigorous research done on a randomized controlled trials, which is the gold standard. Uh, and they discovered, um, this is someone at MIT, Esther Duflo, I don't know if some of you know her. Uh, she discovered that, well, micro lending is good, but it's not great. It's not transformative the way we all thought it was. But micro savings is fabulous. And she found some really uh, strong results in micro savings. So now you've got a whole bunch of people now using that um, kind of result to actually implement interesting different solutions. So Cheryl, let's stay on that for a minute. When, when you were writing uh, The Path of Peers uh, and talking to people who had just gotten off the ground and had created great organizations, were they focused on this hybrid approach? Were you seeing more and more of that? Do you feel like that's a new thing or we're uncovering something that's been going on for a while? Well, I, I don't think there's one hybrid approach. There's many, and it really depends upon the situation, upon the particular entrepreneur, upon the upon the you know the circumstances. So sometimes, if you're coming at it from a for-profit perspective, you might choose something because you want to be able to bring in an NGO partner. So you'll create a structure around that. If you're coming at it from the NGO perspective, you may want to actually have a subsidiary that is you know a little bit more profit-oriented. So you'll create something, and there's a structure around that. So there's really no one hybrid structure. There's there's multiple ones, um, but you know I would say that there is still a disconnect. So you know, for instance, the typical you know even if she's a for setting up a for-profit venture, uh, and she wants to help, for instance, um, women in certain areas. In 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 I'm thinking of one particular example in the DRC in in, in the DRC um, or w Rwanda, and she's still having difficulty raising funds. Uh, even though it's a for-profit mechanism, but you know it is in Rwanda, it's very far away, and she can also have a domestic application here, but it's still difficult because people um, in the for-profit world, the funders who still are for-profit oriented, and although there are foundations, they are not yet on board with this kind of hybrid thing. They're just more used to funding nonprofits, but the for-profit uh, you know, investors are much more used to funding something with just an ROI. And the social dimension, they're thinking, well, that's nice if it's gravy, but they also don't want it to diminish the ROI. So, you know, you've still got a little bit of a disconnect. So, so Shiza, when you were getting Malala Fund off the ground, um, that's, that's a, an NGO. Um, can you contrast a little bit the experience of doing that with some of the more impact investing oriented opportunities that you're seeing today? And what are the differences in the resources and funding sources that you saw then and are seeing now? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the Malala Fund w um, is a nonprofit and we started off with two goals. One was to advocate at a global policy level to get government to enact the types of political changes that would enable more girls and boys to get 12 years of education. And the other was to support local community-based organizations that were creating change on the ground for girls directly, particularly in some of the harder places in the world, so northern Nigeria in the wake of the kidnapping of hundreds of girls by Boko Haram, or uh, Syrian refugee host countries like Jordan that are facing an influx. 
And the sources of funding that we accessed were traditional philanthropy, um, be it high net worth individuals, be it grants, and be it um, digital fundraising. So we had a, a great um, brand story that was very appealing, particularly to young people. And we were able to mobilize young people to donate $10, $15, and do so repeatedly. And that became a big part of, of our funding base. Um, when I look at a lot of social entrepreneurs, like the ones that Cheryl's talking about, I think it is difficult because um, if, you're, if you're a pure nonprofit, you can tap into traditional philanthropy sources. If you're a social entrepreneur, then it's not clear where you go. And um, impact investors are still sort of um, straddling whether they focus heavily on returns or they focus heavily on social impact. And you do have a growth in, in early stage funding, but some of my favorite uh, social enterprises that are actually scaling and have now raised a hun hundred or so in venture um, have ex often exhausted the impact investing sources. Um, there aren't a lot of low cost uh, debt options. And so I think it's really important to start to structure more capital to serve these solutions because very of often they are the ones that are scaling. Yeah, I would encourage the um, institutional uh, players also uh, to make use more of uh, program-related investments. I mean, I think that that's definitely something on people's radars. But you know, there aren't as many deals in in PRIs as um, you know one would think that could be that um, uh, could be um, you know available because it is such a powerful model. Uh, and um, and also, I think that. <laughs> The two sides are kind of, if you look at the two extremes, they're kind of suspicious of each other, you know. And and I wish that there was a little bit more interaction. Uh, you know, there really can be such great uh, um, greatness that can come out of the two sides working together, whether it's an, an you know an NGO and a for profit. They really can, but right now they're kind of like dancing around each other, and they I think they definitely will go to the go to the prom, but I think that it's going to take <laughs> a little bit of time. Well, right, and, and given that we're an action-oriented crowd here that's got uh, every sector represented, we should all be thinking, usually when there's gaps like that, there's major opportunities for impact and profit. So uh, it's, a, it's a happy time for everyone who's in the space, I think. Let's, uh, let's actually just play on one thing, Shiza, that you talked about. And Cheryl, I, I heard you talk about an emerging entrepreneur as her. And I think that's great, uh, you know, especially given the context of what's going on in female founding and female investing for female founders. Could you talk a little bit, Shiza, about the work that you're doing there and what we're unlocking in terms of the potential of female founders in the social sector? Yeah, I think there is something very exciting happening globally with more women starting companies um, that are highly innovative. I was just um, at a program in, based in NASA and Mountain View called Singularity University, and they brought in 78 entrepreneurs and thinkers from 43 different countries. Over 50% were women. Everyone other than me was a hardcore technologist who was working on a, uh, on a hard science that could potentially change the world. And a large percentage of these women were from emerging markets. Um, and I'm seeing that pattern over and over again when you go to Latin America, um, when you go to South Asia. I, I see more women, I'm just recently the woman who won uh, the Fields Medal in math, uh, the highest honor in mathematics was an Iranian woman, trained her entire, entire life in Iran. Um, and so whether here in the US or internationally, we're seeing more women step up and create really impact-oriented businesses, uh, but they're absent from networks of mentorship, from training, um, from funding sources, um, from visibility. I moved, I grew up in Pakistan and was in the Middle East when I was launching the Malala Fund and made the deliberate decision to be based in New York because I knew that as a woman founder, I needed the networks, the visibility, the funding, the press that I could only access here. Uh, and so I think there's a real opportunity to create networks, whether it's venture capital, whether it's fellowships like Echoing Green or Ashoka, um, but more of them and, and more of them focused on women um, that really um, hone in on this opportunity. And I would say uh, there's definitely a huge um, wave of female entrepreneurs. Um, I think in some ways the U.S. is kind of behind. I mean, if, when you think about it, in China, China has uh, the highest number of self-made female billionaires, more than here in the U.S. So, I mean, you know, we're kind of a little bit behind the game. Um, but um, I also think that there definitely is a huge amount of progress. Uh, and um, what I, I think 
has to be navigated is that if you look in the venture capital, the for-profit venture capital world, there are very few females. We've you know heard that story many times, especially through Ellen Powell and the and the lawsuit there that opened up a lot of things in the public. Um, and I do think that uh, hopefully uh, what's two things that I hope will not happen, and I, and I don't think there is happening so much, um, is that the social entrepreneurs or the female entrepreneurs who have maybe a social bent to the particular venture that they're you know, creating, you know, aren't going to you know, be locked out again as you know, even if they were a purely for-profit venture in the venture capital world, it's just hard to break into that. It's hard to get, um, when you present, it's hard for venture capitalists to really take you seriously. Uh, and so I think there's that element. The other element is that I also hope, and I don't think this is happening yet, but I just hope that, uh, you know, it's not as though the um, funders will look at these female uh, you know, social entrepreneurs and say, well, they're doing the soft side of things. I don't know if they really can deliver on the actual product um, or maybe even the ROI. So, you know, I don't yet see that happening, but I think that that's something to be mindful of so that the female entrepreneurs, they really can, you know, uh, direct and target their, their addresses so that they don't fall into that trap. And I think that's, I think that's, a, that's an excellent point, and it also applies to social entrepreneurs in general, right? I think over and again, we see social entrepreneurs as bleeding hearts doing good work because they care, but the most successful ones are actually the most rigorous operators that I have ever seen. Uh, so one of my favorite startups is Bridge Academies, the fastest growing school of a uh, chain of low cost private schools. And the operational capabilities that are required to scale low cost private schools ac across rural Kenya, across rural Nigeria are significant. So I think measuring um, founders uh, by understanding their capabilities as operators um, is important in the social impact space. Well, I'm so glad we're gonna actually uh, have one last question here before we go. We're gonna hear from, um, from two amazing entrepreneurs who are entering the scaling moment. Um, but before we go there, at the very beginning, as a social entrepreneur, what are the resources, what are the things, for example, Cheryl, that you heard most from the folks that you were interviewing that were needs at the very early point when you start a new social enterprise? Funds. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, then. <laughs> we have our mission, everyone. <laughs> I would say mentorship, hands-on mentorship, because if you can find a mentor who can, who can actually help you navigate, here's who you email if you want to get the story about your work, here's who you email if you want to tap into funding sources. Things exist in the vast ecosystem, but most people who haven't had the opportunity to interact with that ecosystem just don't know how to navigate it. And so I think there's a, a, you know, a saturation of wealth in certain areas going to certain types of businesses and then all of these incredible startups that don't know how to access. And so mentors who can connect. Great, well with that, uh, Cheryl and Shiza, thanks so much. We'll be back for questions later. I'm going to turn it over to George. I think George and I are both pretty glad that Resolution funds and mentors. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks so much, Oliver, Shiza, and Cheryl. That was a fantastic way to get things started. Um, and it's, it's a great joy and pleasure and really a privilege uh, to have with us today Rachel Chong, uh, the founder and, uh, and CEO of Catchifier, and, uh, which is, if you haven't heard of it, the largest and the premier uh, skills-based volunteering platform. Uh, and they do a ton, as Oliver alluded to early on, uh, in bringing together volunteers uh, from an employee engagement level for enterprise level clients, um, bringing them together at this point with over 4,000 uh, nonprofits and, um, and social enterprises who are looking uh, to tap those skills that those people want to give. So, a uh, wonderful example of just how public and private come together. And Soraya Darabi, who co-founded Zaidi and is uh, now continuing also in the impact investing space. And Zaidi, uh, also for anyone who doesn't know, uh, I think was praised by Forbes as the Whole Foods of apparel. Uh, so really bringing together uh, conscientious uh, consumers uh, with responsibly sourced uh, products. So uh, thank you so much for both being here. Um, as, as we discussed, we're gonna be talking about scaling uh, and the challenges that come with that within the social sector. Um, I think before we get into the how, uh, it's important to ask why. Uh, there are challenges, sort of systemic challenges, to building a business to begin with, but once you add a mission layer to it, 
uh, it increases the complexity around it. Um, so, so why is it that you think uh, that social enterprises can sort of become really big, and why specifically the social enterprises that you've been involved in? Rachel, why don't you start? Sure. Um, and first of all, I want to say that um, in sitting in the audience and, and hearing Shiza and Cheryl, I don't know about you, but um, I got the chills. I think you know we're in a very interesting moment where um, we're seeing you know massive changes happen in a really positive way. One, women entrepreneurs, um, and you know this new type of entrepreneur, which is a social entrepreneur. And I remember five years ago, um, Catch a Fire just had its fifth year um, uh, birthday, which makes us one of the oldest social enterprises ever. So we feel <laughs> we feel old and gray, but we're also proud of that. Um, and I remember five years ago, this conversation wasn't even happening. And I remember that spectrum that you that you um, drew, Cheryl, was something that I was trying to you know come up with. Um, that you know there there was no the spectrum didn't exist. Um, and now it does, and it's it's really exciting. And so to also just flip what you said on it on on its head, you said, um, you know, building a company is hard, but then when you put a mission layer on top, it's harder. Um, for I think a social entrepreneur, and for many social entrepreneurs, it's actually not about putting a mission layer on top. It's that the mission is first, and we're trying to solve real social problems. We see gaps. Um, in in the world, uh, problems that have not yet been solved, um, and we think about solving that problem first, and then we think about okay, what is the right structure to actually solve that problem? So. In starting Catch a Fire, I spent a lot of time thinking about what is the right business model. Um, Catch a Fire could um, very well have been a nonprofit. Um, we chose to be a B corporation, and I really don't like to use the word for profit because we're not for profit. We're for mission. We just happen to have um, a business model uh, that that is aligned with um, the mission. Um, so I'm not sure if I answered your question, but I, I think that um, social uh, enterprise can be big, specifically in our case. Um, it, there's a huge opportunity, and, and the opportunity that we're going after um, is making it possible for talented people all around the world uh, to be able to give those skills to nonprofits and social enterprises who need it. Um, a stat from LinkedIn earlier this year is that 82% of their 320 million members say they want to volunteer their skills. Um, and not even a tiny little dot of that is actually able to do that. That's our market. It's massive. Um, and companies are also seeing um, the opportunity to plug their talent base into opportunities like this. It is not, it's not just you know, uh, better, stronger community impact, but there's also a business reason to that. And that's retention, and that's talent attraction. Right. And I think um, you know, the, the point that you made about uh, the fact that Catch a Fire could have been a nonprofit, I think, you know, points to the fact that, um, you know, you each actually have uh, some private sector experience uh, in your background, um, and you know, I think a lot of social entrepreneurs are looking for ways to make their organizations sustainable, and that's where where the revenue model comes in, um, and why it ends up actually being important for for you, Soraya, with Zadie. I mean, that that factored in at a, at a bigger level because, uh, you know, at sort of a more direct level because. You're selling products to consumers. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. And I'll just say that um, I was raised by academics. Uh, my mother teaches public policy. And my for-profit experience that launched my career was at the New York Times. Like Cheryl, Cheryl's a personal hero. In fact, there probably wouldn't be a Zadie if it weren't for um, the book before A Path Appears, Half the Sky. So um, I, I think that there is um, this misconception still that remains that, that um, in order to be a social entrepreneur, you need to have a bleeding heart. And yet, here I am, sitting up here on this stage, talking about a for-profit business with a bleeding heart. And I, I do think in the future, it won't be young people like me who were raised by parents who, instead of a spring break, took us on Amnesty International walks. But instead, people are going to see purpose as being um, an essential infusion in any successful business. Yesterday, Fast Company had a great article that said why purpose-driven brands are succeeding against the typical ROI. They they cited IBM 
for their work with Smarter Planet, Patagonia for their work in sustainable apparel and innovative supply chain. They cited GE with Healthy Imagination um, and Tesla, of course, for their work with electronic cars. And the, all of these businesses are thriving. Of course, Whole Foods, which you mentioned earlier, um, you know, went from nothing in revenue and every Silicon Valley investor turning them down when they first went out to funding um, to now being a $13 billion business. And every single one of the founders of these companies consistently when interviewed um, agree that the reason their businesses are succeeding and thriving in a modern marketplace is because they lead with mission. So we didn't think at Zadie that creating um, a company that focused on the storytelling and the journalism behind how good products are made was um, in any way, shape, or form the first and foremost goal. We just thought it was smarter business, period. And as an impact investor now, um, focusing on really early stage companies, I have um, a slight inclination towards funding women. Um, yesterday, for instance, a company called Lakshmi by a social entrepreneur, Lila Jana, who's creating an organic beauty company using 100% organic materials, um, and the workers for her business come from Sama Source, her nonprofit, um, which trains women in the developing world to have skill sets that Fortune 100 companies can then employ. And this kind of company to me just seems like it's the intuitive future, less so um, something that you know uh, is kind of smart marketing. Absolutely, and Lila's actually a, a classmate of mine from school, <laughs> so I know her very well, and I've been tracking her work over the years. It's pretty impressive. Um, going back to something that actually Cheryl brought up, uh, the sectors, the social sector, which sort of inhabits a lot of that intermediate space uh, between private companies, uh, private corporations, I should say, and uh, and and NGOs. Uh, that's all right. Um, thank you. Um, it's pretty nebulous, um, and you know there aren't the same sorts of defined resources and and pathways and capital food chains and structures to sort of follow and stick to. Where did you turn to for support and and sort of uh, you know what what were you looking for as sort of touch points to know that you were heading on the right on the right path as you were starting and and beginning to grow uh, your respective organizations. Well, it certainly wasn't venture capitalists. <laughs> and um, uh, I spend a lot of time in Silicon Valley. There's a running joke there that you probably have heard before, which says that most venture-backed companies in the Valley are solving problems uh, mainly, predominantly, um, uh, uh, considered problems because young white guys don't have their mothers anymore. So you look at on-demand economy and it's your your butler on demand and your cleaning service on demand and recently it was take your trash out on demand and these are not big problems um, affecting the majority of the world and certainly we encountered that when we went out to Pitch Zaidi in the valley on Sand Hill Road. We'd say to um, the men in their Patagonia blazer, <laughs> you know, uh, sweatshirts, you know, we have a mission-driven business and at first it went in one ear out the other. But luckily there were incredible VCs who did believe in us like Tony Florence of NEA, Joe Medved at SoftBank. Um, Mentors is something Shiza mentioned earlier, which I have to reiterate, is um, so crucial, so essential. So um, mentors in the social impact world um, can be people who are high net worth individuals who have had great successes in their careers and want to give back, or they can be people who have built and scaled large organizations who are excited to help a company that aligns with their values. Um, identifying them is difficult. Sometimes it helps to be part of networking groups where you meet 100 people like that all at once. Um, so Rachel and I are both YGLs, and um, that's Young Global Leaders at the World Economic Forum. And I certainly met a lot of early um, supporters and enablers of our vision through that particular network. But it's a hard one to get access to. So if you're in a local community with a smaller subset of people who want to enable social entrepreneurs, the best tool, of course, is online through social media, connecting people across Twitter and Facebook, and um, reaching out even blindly with a thoughtful message I typically say to young entrepreneurs, you know, no more than three or four sentences, pinpointing something that that person has said to press or recently that you want to identify as why they're important to you and one very specific ask that's easy for them to do to just begin a discussion. Rachel, what's your experience been? You know, it's, it's really interesting. Um, I think that the social entrepreneurs today, um, at least I can speak for myself, are actually very privileged most of the time, meaning that we were born um, in environments that, that built strong women, um, 
my mother was a, a role model, a working woman. Uh, I, I grew up going to international school. I, had, I have a lot of privilege, and that um, affords me this opportunity. Um, and I think that, you know, for the folks in the room who are looking for something meaningful to do, I think there's a huge opportunity to help build this space so that we can cultivate social entrepreneurs that don't look like the privileged folks. Like, thank goodness that, you know, I have this opportunity, but, you know, how many folks around the world um, don't have the opportunity to even use Twitter, um, it, let alone they don't even know that the World Economic Forum exists. Um, and, you know, it's an interesting time where we're pioneering the space. Uh, and, uh, you know, it does take, you know, really strong operators. But I think there's also a huge opportunity to, to build an infrastructure that allows um, folks who aren't in the upper echelons of this socioeconomic range to also participate in um, solving the world's biggest problems because those are the folks who are also are really in touch with what the world needs. Um, so I, that doesn't answer your question, but I think it's worth mentioning. I think it, I think it brings us to, to my final question, uh, which uh, builds directly on that. Uh, we're, we're looking at a room full of, of business leaders of uh, leaders in the philanthropic uh, and, and non-governmental space, um, public sector uh, champions of a lot of the causes uh, that that your work and Resolutions work and Resolutions Fellows work is is trying to push forward. So, um, you know, along along that line, uh, what can this room uh, do to sort of push the space forward to change the face of uh, of of entrepreneurship? Um, you know, I have, I have a sister who's uh, graduating from Barnard this year. Uh, she's a strong young woman. Mm -hmm. I have uh, my, my wife who's a, a consultant early in her career. Um, you know, and, and I want to be able to share with them some of the things that you say. Um, so, so share with us a little bit of sort of what, what we can do as a group in this room to really uh, move the ball forward on all those fronts. Well, pledge our or pledge ours to catch a fire for sh for sure. Um, let's see. It, I think that it's something that was touched upon earlier, but you know, big businesses typically have CSR arms or occasionally galas once a year or, or fundraising events. You know, you can run a half marathon to raise money for a cause, and then if you're in that system, you sort of feel like, oh, I've checked off that box, and and now it's done. So I encourage people to think about. Um, uh, giving back to, to something impactful in a micro way, the way, the way that we do in, in digital speak. Uh, think about your micro donation in terms of time or energy or, or funding on a daily basis. Um, I would also say to pay more attention to the B Corp um, businesses that are launching every single year. And you'll find that you know millennials who really want to vote with their dollars, um, this has been said time and time again, but pay attention to the businesses that are rising up and the consistency of how quickly they're scaling um, in, in accordance with the missions and the values that these businesses infuse. And finally, I, I'll say that I, I agree with you about the fact that most of these businesses are um, started by the privileged, but we are living in a time where more people have smartphones than clean water. So think about how digital access and connectivity, especially through mobile, can um, further the mission of the either social businesses that you support or um, the issues that are important to you. Rachel, anything to add? Sure. Uh, can I ask how many people in this room um, are coming from companies? And then government? And then entrepreneurs? Awesome. Um, well, first of all, big shout out to Resolution. Um, it, they do amazing work serving over 230 um, social entrepreneurs now. Um, and bringing together this amazing panel, I, you know, speaking to the to the businesses in the room, I think there's there's a huge opportunity um, to connect with this movement. Um, it's really easy to do it through Catch a Fire, but there certainly are you know other ways. Um, I think it's also about being brave. 
you know, this stuff is new. Um, you, you know, when we when we make decisions, we off we often look for um, examples of success, um, and we look for that data. But we're still in the phase where we don't have that data yet. Like five years of social enterprises existing is not very much data. Um, there actually hasn't been, you know, huge exits in social enterprises, and that's okay because you guys can be the pioneers. Um, and it really requires. Uh, folks who have the courage and have vision to invest in the best social entrepreneurs and the best women entrepreneurs um, and to pave that path forward. And it's such an interesting time because that's where we're at. And it's just, you know, it, it's amazing. And we shouldn't, um, you know, we shouldn't be looking for 20 years of data of why, you know, social enterprises exiting. It doesn't exist. Um, so let's be realistic um, and and just, you know, embrace where we're at um, and have the courage to really push um, this movement forward. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to pass the... Uh, I'm going to pass the microphone baton to Tracy Allard. Thank you. Well, it is truly an honor to be joined by two more distinguished speakers. First, Resolution Ambassador Anne Veneman and Advisory Board Co-Chair Ryan Whalen. We will now draw on their very rich cross-sectoral experience to talk about the support of youth-led ventures that have grown to scale. So first, can you talk a little bit about how public private and civil society organizations support the acceleration and sustainability of youth-led ventures, and also how the sectors are evolving in response to the rise of youth entrepreneurs and their very firm expectation that innovation and growth and capital must inherently be tied to social responsibility. Do you want me to start? Sure. Thank you, Anne. Well, that was a big question. Um, I want to pick up on a little bit about what's been said in the previous panels. And Cheryl talked a little bit about the suspicion of a lot of the different sectors. So you've really got, you know, I think Mutar Kent was talking about this earlier today. You've got the private sector, you've got government, and you've got sort of the NGO sector. And there, I think in the past, it's fair to say, that there's been a lot of distrust, the suspicion that Cheryl talks about. Uh, they haven't wanted to work together. Um, having come out of a large organization that works like an NGO, which is UNICEF, um, people that are aid workers have traditionally seen their roles as sort of, you know, we do things differently, we don't work with the private sector, they aren't out to help people. But I see a tremendous sea change happening, and I think it's partly driven by this movement of young people in social business. I also think it's driven by a continuous realization that aid per se has not worked, and we really need to engage economic empowerment for sustainability and improvement and alleviation of poverty over the long term. And so, I see government, for example, in some of the aid agencies, you look at USAID now funding things like Feed the Future, where they're partnering with the private sector. You didn't see much of that before. Uh, of course, in the private sector, you've got the social business sector, which our speakers have talked so articulately about, but it's also a driving force on the side of larger, older businesses to engage in creating shared value, for example, where you're looking at how to build value for shareholders and value for society. And this really picks up, up on the whole concept. And then, of course, on the NGO side, I think the larger NGOs, they're a little slower to come to the table, but the newer NGOs are looking for ways to be a partner with the private sector, with governments. And that's where I see not only this social business with young people changing the face of how we really address these issues of the world, 
but I also see it in the NGO sector. And I think now NGOs are starting to come around. You know, you see the Global Compact at the UN, which is relatively new. You see things like Beyond the Brands, where they're really engagement, which is an Oxfam initiative. Um, and so I see a lot of change taking place in a very short period of time, and I think really for the better, but I think there's still a lot of, a lot of ways to go. So I'll uh, give you a couple of uh, notes from my experience at the Rockefeller Foundation, but also from my time uh, working for Mike Bloomberg at City Hall. And at Rockefeller, when we think about uh, global solutions, we see our responsibility as being twofold. Number one, to uh, catalyze global solutions and also to set up a pathway for their sustainability uh, beyond our involvement. And so for us, we think about how philanthropic dollars are different than dollars from the private sector or from government, and they are so much more flexible. Um, they're also a lot smaller than all the dollars that are spent by government or the private sector. So how can we take our resources and other foundations uh, like Rockefeller, older or newer? Um, and so what we do is we look at uh, some challenge that we want to solve. And so we're thinking about, for example, how do we bring solar energy to rural India? Um, how do we connect uh, youth in Africa to the first rung of the technology jobs ladder? And when we do that, from the beginning we are working with both the public and the private sector because those are the channels by which this will continue uh, once we are no longer involved. So we have time-bound initiatives that are structured specifically so that when we're not involved, uh, uh, these things will carry on. And uh, I, and that approach to it, I think, is a relatively new one to philanthropy. And it's not unique to us by any means, but I think in the um, past decade plus, a lot of foundations have understood uh, the largesse of philanthropy alone will not get us to sustainable solutions. Um, and so... Uh, there are examples of social enterprises where we've done uh, program-related investments in. Uh, a good example would be Cloud Factory, which uh, has been doing digital work um, in Nepal for some time. As they were looking to do an expansion into Kenya, we seeded their uh, expansion uh, into Nairobi uh, as part of uh, that tech jobs initiative that I described. And we put uh, program-related investments where we are doing debt or equity investments into companies uh, at the core of a lot of our initiatives. Uh, we also make uh, grants to private institutions as well, uh, but we understand that different instruments are needed to be able to uh, address different kinds of challenges. Uh, we also work with companies that probably wouldn't call themselves social enterprises, but they have kind of public mission is in their blood and, and is in their ethos. I think about Planet Labs in San Francisco. They fly flocks of microsatellites uh, around the world, and uh, we have something called the Global Resilience Partnership, and that's looking at new long-term resilience solutions in the Sahel and the Horn of Africa, Southeast Asia, and their, uh, their imaging can actually provide really interesting insights into what's happening uh, to, uh, to rivers and to forests and uh, other natural spaces and what are the kinds of resilience solutions that are needed, and so we're working very closely with them uh, in our initiatives. And uh, just reflect on my time in government, uh, we thought a lot about at City Hall, how do you both take the resources of government and make them available to innovators? And also, how do you sort of orient the work of government so that it is open to the work of innovators? So we spent a lot of time uh, on open data, for example, where how do you bring all this information that government has that's always been behind a wall to make it available through things like the Big Apps Challenge and other uh, opportunities like that where uh, companies can look at that data and create solutions that can uh, provide information and insight on issues of education and health and the environment um, and uh, for those of you who read it, uh, there was a great fixes column a couple of weeks ago. Um, well, there was one about resolution the week before, the one I'm talking about that you all should read. Um, but there was one uh, that talked about how San Francisco and Barcelona and other cities, when they do RFPs, they are beginning to uh, put out RFPs that don't say, here's the solution we're looking for, and the same five or ten usual suspects show up. What they're doing is they're saying, here's the problem we're dealing with, and what are the whole range of solutions that might be out there. And that's where I think government is starting to really open itself up to uh, social entrepreneurs who understand these are really interesting solutions and these are things that would never have gotten on the radar of government otherwise. Thank you. So youth entrepreneurship is often fueled by principles of autonomy and creativity and idealism. 
how can large institutions help to protect the things that make these enterprises so special once they've matured? Is that kind of balance even possible? Well, I think uh, one of the things that um, large institutions can do is look at where innovation is taking place and help to support that. So, you know, when you look at the social entrepreneur space, I think of organizations like Educate, which in Uganda really helps to educate at the high school level young people on entrepreneurship uh, principles, ideals, and really financial literacy. I think these are the kinds of things that larger organizations can help then to see the model, uh, scale it up, and provide funding so that you can expand this kind of thing. I think this whole issue of financial literacy uh, in schools, not in both globally, both in the global north and the global south, needs to really be looked at if we're going to move to a more entrepreneurial society, which I think we're doing with a technology economy, we're gonna need people that understand how to actually do basic financial transactions, have a savings account. Uh, and I think this is one of the things we're not really talking about is how do we, how do we get the building blocks in the education systems? And I think that's where some of the larger institutions can really play a big role in how we build this for the future. Um, at Rockefeller, uh, when we build our uh, initiatives, one of the things we do is, uh, because we have this coalition of partners that we work with across all sectors, we try to be really clear about what it is that our um, overall goals are and then some specific targets underneath that. And when we uh, decide we want to work with somebody, we have faith in that institution, uh, and we have some sense of um, uh, th there's a clarity of kind of purpose and ability to execute with that institution. And so when we've worked with a lot of social entrepreneurs, we've said, here's the target we're going for. We trust you. Go get it. And, um, and it requires a lot of constant communication and collaboration with them, but we've really tried to create a space where, whether it's uh, institutions that we have given grants to, um, that we've done um, program-related investments with, we, uh, we are relying upon their expertise and their commitment and their focus on mission to be able to achieve those goals, and that's part of why they're appealing to us. And so uh, I would say for, for anyone who is in uh, an institution, uh, a, a large institution like Tracy was referring to, to the extent that you can create some really clear targets and some kind of rules of the game and then letting your partners get to it, I think is a really powerful and empowering uh, approach to how you do business. You know, one of the things that uh, when I was at UNICEF, we started a little unit, an innovation unit. And that unit now um, had, as of 2011, created something called U-Report, which in they now have a million users around program countries uh, engaging in, as youth in community issues, in what they're concerned about. And this can go and be a, a, a pulse of communities for government officials, for people looking at how to improve their own communities. And I think this is also the kind of building block that can help build the institutional um, knowledge in young people that they can do things to make a difference. Uh, one last question. Organizations like UNICEF and Rockefeller have legacies as enduring leaders in their sectors. What practices or lessons should young entrepreneurs borrow to ensure that their enterprises are also enduring and even once they're gone? Uh, so uh, Rockefeller uh, is is definitely a gray hair in the space. We're 102 years old, and so when uh, and so for us, uh, when we look back on our history and why we have continued to be hopefully impactful, um, it has been about. Um, making sure that we are clear on our purpose, the results that we've achieved, uh, trying to really build serious and long-standing relationships, understanding that we work in a world where the partners that we will collaborate with will change and recombine over time. And so the lessons I would encourage you uh, uh, to keep in mind are, 
how do you make sure that the world understands what it is that you do in as clear and concise a way as possible? And how do you also make sure that you remember that uh, someone that you meet tomorrow may be uh, a collaborator and a partner for you six months or a year or 10 years down the road, uh, and we live in this fundamentally interconnected world, and for us, 100 years later, we're still coming back to people that we worked with a century ago. I would agree with all of that, and I would add to it that um, you also, as an organization, need to be able to adapt to the changing times. Uh, and you need to be willing to not be so invested in your own organization and brand that you can't partner with others or even merge with others with similar missions. Thank you both. So uh, <clears throat> we have about 10 minutes left for questions. We're going to do something I fondly refer to as question bundling. So show of hands for any questions we have. <clears throat> and if we have too many, I will bundle them and parse them out myself. Any questions? Maybe we won't have to bundle. In the back, right there. So my for, hi, everyone. Um, so my question is actually for Ryan, although it's open to, to any of the panelists. So one of the things that you said that stood out to me was really this alternative approach you're seeing in the RFPs that cities are putting out, right? So it's, it is an approach that sounds like it really fosters a certain creativity and an openness and an innovation. And so as someone who loves to nerd out to social values and how we can shift them, we all have our things, um, how do you see that pattern as emblematic of a larger shift, either in social values or in problem solving? I, uh, I spend a lot of time working in government, and I will tell you that government is very, very slow to change in just about any possible way. And I think that this reorientation to, uh, to, to thinking about problems, not uh, assumed solutions, um, I, I, I think is, speaks to uh, the nature of trust. Uh, I think, it, um, as Anne was talking about, um, and the idea that the that communities may have really compelling um, and important and correct ideas that, uh, that can be impactful and helpful for government. And it's something that government has often been kind of behind the ramparts and just sort of doing what it is they need to do uh, to fill potholes, to educate children, to uh, give businesses licenses. And there actually are sometimes better ways and uh, more impactful ways uh, to do that. And the idea that government is even beginning to listen to that, I think is a very different reorientation between citizenry uh, and government. Great, further questions? Okay, so one, um, Cassandra, why don't you go, and then Bonnie after. Uh, Cassandra, in the back. Um, I guess uh, listening to the importance earlier on of mentorship, and something I know that Oliver and we've discussed is the importance of what I would, we would call sponsorship. Um, it strikes me there was a question asked of what we could do in the room as, as leaders and one of them maybe put our hand up to sponsor somebody. I was wondering, Ryan or Anne, what are your views around um, sponsorship, sort of actually lifting somebody up and putting them in the direct line of, of, uh, of, of, of opportunity as opposed to being the person that's there maybe as a guide day by day? Um, do you have experience in the difference? Great, and Bonnie, why don't we go and we'll package those questions up. Thanks. Um, I'm a Resolution Fellow, and I think one of the most appealing things about jo re joining Resolution Project during kind of uh, the social venture challenges is that um, Oliver and George said that we won't have a limit on how many um, uh, how many ventures and fellows we fund. It depends on how suitable and great everyone is, and that's really rare because it fosters collaboration. And I think kind of to the point that Anne and Ryan made in the end is really about collaboration and. Social ventures need to be thinking about partnership collaboration at the very start, but in this competitive nature of like kind of getting funding, especially for youth-led social ventures, how can we strike that balance? Um, so actually, those were very similar questions. I think um, uh, Anne and, and Ryan, the question to you is really about uh, Cassandra. I think what you mean by sponsorship is not financial necessarily, but about the idea of mentorship that comes also with connectivity and networking and activation of people for your mentee, as it were. So that and collaboration in the sector, what can we do better? What's going right? Uh, 
Um, <clears throat> well, I think the, I mean, I agree with what was said on the panel earlier about mentorship, and I think uh, it's something I've certainly tried to do throughout my career, and particularly as I've, you know, come through different stages, is, is mentor people. But also, I think this aspect of connectivity is extremely important. It's not just talking to your mentee, it's how do you, how do you help people make the right connections? Um, how do you help people really find others that may be working in the same space, may be able to help them with either funding or a business opportunity? Um, but I think that has to be part of the whole mentorship is, is how do you really make the connections that will help people advance their, their purpose? We have time for maybe one last question here. Uh, over there. Hey, um, thank you guys for speaking to us. We really, I'm speaking for myself, but I'm sure I'm speaking for, for everyone here. You're teaching us so much. Uh, my question is um, in regards to social media. Um, how effective do you see social media today as a medium for social change? And if you think it's effective today, do you think it's going to keep on being effective in the future? Maybe if I could ask Soraya, Shiza, and George each to take a quick crack at that. So when I started out um, my career at 21, I was working at Reddit, um, a social news platform that back then had very few users and uh, now sees sometimes over a billion page views a month. And then the New York Times managing social media, um, again, at its infancy, it was the tool that would spark revolutions and allow journalists to connect with their contingencies. And now it's such a loud marketplace that um, people are turning to disparate social communities to connect with niche audiences, which I actually think is the trend of the future that will continue and be more powerful. Every social platform has a different identity, an identity, if you will. And these identities need to be understood in the vernacular of big businesses and social enterprises alike, because it's no longer important to just have a Twitter presence, for instance. Um, I have many followers, but I rarely tweet, because I try to only post things that I think are important to say, as opposed to being in a constant 24-7 real-time dialogue. So what you're looking now in the future to see are um, new platforms emerging that have a little bit of a social media bent and a big um, catalyst possibility for them to reach larger groups of people who share similar interests. Um, my investing partner um, was one of the co-creators of Thunderclap, which is a wonderful tool I recommend to anyone in this room who has a campaign they'd like to begin online to reach audiences um, with a powerful message in one particular moment. But you'll see more and more businesses like this, for-profit organizations emerge, connecting um, not just millennials, because everyone's online now, but um, uh, people with purpose, with the right audiences who need to connect with them for, the, for a powerful ROI. And lastly, I'll say that it's almost unfortunate that um, the most successful online fundraising campaigns are the ones with the silliest sort of memes or tactics. If you look at Ice Bucket Challenge, for instance, how much money did that raise for a disease that very few people still know very little about? Um, so it's important to make sure that while you're thinking about fundraising, there's now that double bottom line of also educating the consumers and social media is powerful and purposeful for that, but it's a double-edged sword that I think more people need to think about. Yeah, in my, in my day job, I, uh, I, I spend a lot of time um, talking to clients about what, what to sort of chase, right? Because there, there are just so many platforms, so many media, so many forms of media, um, so many ways to reach out to people. Um, social media is here to stay in some way or another. Um, you know, and I, I, think, I think the trends that Soraya pointed out are, are absolutely correct, and I think it's certainly going in that direction. Um, and I think the big takeaway from all of that is there is a, a mechanism for individuals to, to gain access to a platform, right? And, and people sort of, um, you know, along that theme of changing the face of, of entrepreneurs and of influencers, um, social media in whatever form it will be in over the, the coming years, um, and whatever that incarnation will be, um, will will allow for that. And so, you know, to, to that end, um, it's been a, a, a wonderful thing, uh, especially in the space. Terrific. So a couple of last words, but before, ooh, yeah, that would be a mistake. 
A couple last things before we close. Um, if I can have all the panelists and moderators come back up right up here. Well, I'm just gonna, I took it upon myself to be the court rapporteur because we had a, a lot of information. So I just wanna share with you guys a few key takeaways as you walk out of the room and thank these wonderful folks. Um, I think it's exciting that we're seeing new sources of social entrepreneurs, including women, and also to Rachel's point, uh, folks from more at risk communities that have great ideas and we're, we're trying to access them more and more. So the more we can do on that, the better. Capital formation, types of capital, PRIs, debt, that sort of thing, particularly those of us who have access to capital. Um, it would be really great for us to think about how to bring that capital to bear on emerging social entrepreneurs. Uh, the idea of, of hybrid business structures, B Corps, and the flexibility to pick different structures is really exciting now and it's much different than it used to be. The idea of mentor networks and the different types of mentorship and sponsorship that people can access is very exciting. The more we can do to get people into those mentor networks, the better they can do for themselves, meeting the people they need to meet. Uh, the idea of micro donations, uh, even if you have a day job that sticks you in front of Excel all day, you can do things and your corporation can too. Um, the idea of flexible dollars, thank you Ryan, I hadn't heard that before, that's really cool. The idea that philanthropic dollars can actually help generate returns even when paired with other types of capital. Uh, the idea of, uh, of trusting the entrepreneur, one thing that I think of as a venture capitalist in my day job is the fact that we will subscribe a $3 million round for a company and the entrepreneur gets to do what they want to do in this in the social sector, often it's spend my money in X, Y, and Z ways, but not A, B, and C ways. It shows a lack of trust. It's something for us all to think about as funders. And then uh, finally, the power of relationships and collaboration, and more than just a handshake, but following up with action. So with that, I want to thank this amazing group of people for their time. I want to thank you for coming.